Okay, this is lab five of the respiratory system. The next lab event will be also uh, your first lab practical exam. So I want to get this in, take the time to review uh, the material in the Saracus uh, text. That's the lab text you have. We're going to go over uh, exercises 25 and 26. We will skip sections 26.4, 26.5, but we're going to get into some aspects of the respiratory system that you really do need to know about. And with that, let's begin. Our objectives are to review the gross anatomy of the respiratory system. Now, with slides and models again, this is something that we're going to be dependent more on um, the diagrams and the charts and the images that are in your text. We will review the respiratory system function. This includes the importance of Boyle's law and the muscles of the respiratory system. Uh, you are to complete uh, the worksheets, that's pages 463 to 466, as well as page 483. You'll turn these in uh, by uploading them no later than Friday of this week at 5 p.m. Well, let's get started. When we look at the gross anatomy of the respiratory system, we have to examine the structure of the nose and the nasal cavity. The nose that's the only externally visible component of the respiratory system. Uh, you have this nasal cavity, which is an open space posterior to the nose itself. Now, we have a structure called the nasal septum that divides the nasal cavity into a right and a left half. And this is done by bony and cartilaginous partitions. When we talk about the bony structures that basically uh, allow for the, the structure of that nasal cavity, these include the frontal bone, nasal bones, ethmoid, which is with its perpendicular plate structure, the inferior nasal conche, the vulmar, and the maxillae. If you're a little bit fuzzy about the bones, I do encourage you to go back to the lab chapter that covers the skull, and that will help you. There are also cartilaginous proportions present. Now, when we have the bony shelves, these are referred to as conche, and they consist of a superior, middle, inferior portions. Now, the space just below the conche is called the medices, and it also has superior, middle, and inferior. What you have to keep in mind is this, as I've taught with a and 1 when we talk to the olfactory sense. When we sniff, we are breathing in with the idea of creating turbulence as the air goes in over the conche. And there you're going to have the olfactory sensory epithelia present that are going to do the chemical analysis. That's a fancy way of saying the sense of smell. This information will be passed up through the olfactory nerves, through the cribriform plate, and up into the olfactory bulb. Now, the hard palate that consists of uh, bones that come from the maxilla and the palatine. The roof of the nasal cavity consists of the frontal ethmoid via the cribriform plate, the sphenoid, and the nasal bone. And here you can see this. So you see basically the nasal bones. Remember, there's two of them here. And then you have, of course, the other structures, the ethmoid. And you will have also the, the uh, structure of the inferior nasal conche. You have, obviously, the maxillae, which plays a role, and you have several other structures here that I want you to be mindful of and locate if you ever come in front of a diagram or the actual skull itself. Now, let's move away and go back to the flesh and blood of a person, and we notice the dorsal of, dorsum of the nose. That's the upper bridge consisting of bone, the nasal bones. But below that, what maintains structure is the nasal cartilages. Now, the nostrils, they're also called the external nares, openings. This is where I've gotten into repeating this in both AP1 and AP2. Break up here, a break up in this part of the nose, will heal faster than a break in the lower part because cartilage is much slower in healing than bone. Okay? <laughs> Now, as we breathe in, air is passing through the nasal cavity. You have the coanae, which is that opening in the, the uh, back or the posterior part of the nasal cavity. 
okay? You can see the hard palate here, the soft palate after that. You have also the pharyngeal opening of the auditory tube in the back here. Once you get to about where the colonia there, you start having the nasal pharynx, okay? And this comes down to you get about past the soft palate where you're more into the oral pharynx. And then you're into the area called the laryngopharynx, which includes, of course, the area around the larynx. This is the epiglottis, which is, of course, going to prevent food from going down into the trachea. We have, of course, the tongue. And then we have this glottis, the opening about where the uh, vocal cords are. Now, when we examine the structure of the pharynx and the larynx, the pharynx is more what we call a throat. It's posterior to the nasal and oral cavities, and it is a passageway for air to the larynx and food to the esophagus. The pharynx will consist of three sections, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx. The larynx consists of pieces of cartilage connected by ligaments and muscles. These contain the vocal cords for phonation. When you do an anterior view, you can see the hyoid bone. That's that unique little bone that we have that's located in the larynx, but it is not attached to any other bone in the body. We have the thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage. Now there's a little membrane called the cricoid membrane. It is superior to the cricoid cartilage, inferior to the thyroid cartilage. This is if you had to do a cricoid, a cricothyromony. Uh, thyrotomony. Now, in other words, this is where if you've ever seen when someone's choking, or better yet, they're having a very difficult time breathing, let's say because of the trachea, inflammation, etc., they will try to put a, a tube in. Now, they don't want to dig into the actual thyroid cartilage lower in the uh, trachea or, or the tracheal cartilages. So there's a very thin little membrane right about here where I'm putting my pointer. And this is what they would do. They would pull the head back gently and they would, of course, add a little disinfectant and they would pop a small incision there and put a breathing tube, uh, a trach tube down. Everybody thinks when they think of tracheotomy, they would actually do something where they would actually cut through some of these cartilage. But actually, this is a much more gentler and quicker to heal process. When we do the posterior view, we see the epiglottis, the artenoid cartilage, the corniculate cartilage, the cuneiform cartilage, the sagittal section. Now in the vestibular ligaments, these are the ligaments that don't produce sounds. It is the vocal ligaments. Those are the true vocal cords. They produce sounds. And the opening of these <clears throat> is called the glottis. So we can see here, anterior view, posterior view, the sagittal, the side view here. And so you see the vestibular ligaments above and the vocal ligaments lower. This is referred to also as the false vocal cords. These are the true vocal cords. And of course, you have the epiglottis here. Now, if you remember, I said the cricoid thyroid ligament, it's right here. As you can see, if someone was to, to go lower into the trachea, they would cut into uh, the cartilage rings. And as I mentioned to you before, cartilage is much slower in healing and repairing than damage that's done to bone or anything else. So what you want to do is avoid that. So you do a very slight slit right here, and you can put in your airway, okay? Now, moving onward, we have the glottis, and there is a structure called the rima glottis on the edges here, and the structure here. We have the vocal folds here and here. The vocal folds of the glottis, when they're closed, and of course you have the structures around it, the, the corniculate cartilage, the cuneiform cartilage, the era epiglottic fold, the vestibular fold, okay, and of course the epiglottis, and then you get up to the point where you have the root of the tongue. Now, 
When we examine the structure of the trachea, this is commonly referred to as the windpipe. It delivers air to the bronchial tree, begins at the level about roughly where C6 vertebrae are, and it's supported by 20 cartilaginous rings. The last cartilage ring of the trachea is called the carina. This is a, a mucous membrane structure uh, loaded with sensory receptors, and they trigger strong cough reflex to prevent the entry of dust or other foreign particles. All right. Interestingly enough, um, the bitter receptor that we have in the sense of the tongue has been found in a similar fashion, these type of receptors, down into these areas. And this is what would trigger a strong cough reflex, anything that would be harmful. Now, this could be smoke particles, it could be dust particles, okay? It could be bacterial cells, but it's got to be enough to trigger some reaction there. If we look at the cross section, we have the trachealis muscle. And this is a smooth muscle that connects to the open ends of the tracheal rings. Now, you have to notice that the esophagus passes posterior to the trachea. Here is the image I'm trying to give you to see. Now, if where my pointer is right here, this was pointing toward the front, the anterior part of the body. You'll notice that this ring is more a C-shaped structure as opposed to a complete solid ring. There's a reason for that. Because if you notice, you have the esophagus right next, and the esophagus has to expand and not rub against any cartilaginous ring here as you swallow and have this expand and contract using peristalsis to push down the bolus of food. So instead of having this being a full ring, we have it as a C-shape and we can increase or decrease the lumen of the trachea by the trachealis muscles here. Now you'll notice what these are. These are just basically what they call tracheal glands, basically mucus producing uh, similar to goblet cells in the approach. And here is the mucosa of the trachea here. Now, let's look at the tracheal cartilage from the front view. We have the larynx, the trachea. Notice right down here, this is the carina of the trachea. And then it branches off into the right main and left main bronchus. Then the bronchus tree divides again to the lobar bronchi, etc. Okay? Now, when we talk about surface anatomy, the respiratory structures in the neck, the laryngeal prominence, that's larger in males than females. When we talk about this, we sometimes call it the Adam's apple. The hyoid bone is superior to the laryngeal prominence. The cricoid thyroid ligament is inferior to the laryngeal prominence, and the cricoid cartilage is inferior to the cricoid thyroid ligament. The first cartilaginous ring of the trachea is inferior to the cricoid cartilage. Uh, now, a lot of this seems to be, well, this is inferior, this is going up, this is going down. It just helps you to review that. The inferior margin of the cricoid cartilage is a boundary between the larynx and the trachea. So you can see them here. Here's the hyoid bone. Here's the laryngeal prominence here. The lamina of the thyroid cartilage is right here. Then we have the cricoid ligament right here, the cricoid cartilage, and then we have the first tracheal ring light here. And what is this? This is, of course, your thyroid gland with its lobes. There's a diagram that is very similar in your lab exercise text, and I encourage you to review it. Now let's examine the structure of the lungs. Lungs are located in the left and right side of the thoracic cavity. They're covered with a double serous membrane called pleural membrane. The pleural cavity is a narrow fluid-filled space between the two pleural membranes. When we talk about the lung structure itself, we have the apex, we have lobes and fissures. It's interesting and it's somewhat different from right and left. Right has three lobes superior, middle, inferior, and fissures, the oblique and the horizontal. That's basically what separates your lobes. 
The left, though, doesn't have as much. It only has two lobes, superior, inferior, and one fissure, and that is called the, the oblique. Now, there is an indentation on the left side of the lung, too. This indentation called the cardiac notch, this is along the medial margin of the left lung. You need to be aware of this. Also, with the uh, surface structures of the lung, you'll notice the hilium. This is medial or the medastial surface on each lung. This is where you have the entry and exit of arteries, veins, bronchi, lymphatic structures, etc. Now, on the left side, you're going to have a groove for the aorta. On the cardiac, and you have what is called a cardiac impression. The lungs have a base. This is also referred to as a diaphragm diaphragmatic surface. And basically, this base is going to rest on the diaphragm itself. Here you have the cut edge of the diaphragm. Here it is here. We have the right lobe, the left lobe. You have the superior uh, lobe here. I should say the right lung and the left lung here. I'm sorry about that. But if you notice down here, you've got the superior lobe, the horizontal fissure, the middle lobe, the oblique fissure, and then the inferior lobe here. On the left lung, though, it's a little bit different. Why? Because if you remember when we were doing the heart anatomy, the heart, about two-thirds of it, kind of shifts over more to the left side if you were to draw a straight line through the thoracic cavity. So you have one oblique fissure, and you have a superior and then an inferior lobe. And you can see these in the diagram here a little bit clearer. Superior, inferior lobe, the base. We have the inferior border here. We have where we have uh, the uh, cardiac notch. You have the oblique fissure, the apex, and the apex is over here. This is the anterior borders on both. You have a middle lobe. You have the horizontal fissure. And then you have the oblique fissure. To help you, you can think about it, oblique is kind of going at an angle. It's not exactly horizontal. It's not vertical. It's more at an angle. And then we have the inferior lobe, which has the base at the bottom. Now, we have the apex, the base. And you'll notice the structure of the helium. And that's where basically the bronchi, the arteries, the veins. Now notice the coloring. They differ, don't they? That's because remember in the pulmonary circuit, pulmonary arteries are bringing in deoxygenated bloods, hence they're going to be somewhat bluish, just for diagrammatic purposes. And the pulmonary veins leaving are going to be containing highly oxygenated blood. Okay? And the same thing on both left and right, you have a hilum. Now, the bronchial tree is a, it's like a tree-like branching structure of the airways in the lungs. The conducting airways distribute air to particular regions of the lung. The respiratory airways, these are airways where gas exchange occurs between lung and pulmonary capillaries. So this begins at the left and right primary bronchi and ends at the alveoli. So you go basically from the primary bronchi to the secondary bronchi a.k.a. lobar. Then you go to tertiary, which is referred to as segmental bronchi, then to the small bronchi, then to the bronchioles, and then to the termi terminal bronchioles. Now, this is the termination of what we call the conducting airways. In other words, we brought air in and out, in and out, by these variations in pressure and uh, volume of the thoracic cavity. When you get down to the respiratory airway, at the respiratory bronchioles, air molecules, oxygen, carbon dioxide, they're going to now move by diffusion, not by flowing of air in and out, etc. So the respiratory airway starts at the respiratory bronchial, goes down to the alveolar duct, the alveolar sac, and the alveoli which are the little areas in the alveolar sac, which you can see right here, okay? Here's the alveoli, and you can see the variations going all the way up in the same way, alveoli, respiratory, bronchial, okay, that's it. From the terminal bronchioles all the way up here, 
This is where you're having the flow of air coming in and out, et cetera. Okay. Now, also notice a couple of closely associated structures. Branch of the pulmonary artery. Bronchiole. Okay. Branch of the pulmonary vein. What's going on here? You're delivering deoxygenated blood and they will eventually be distributed into the capillary beds, which are in intimate. They're right next to the alveoli, and that is where you're going to have gas exchange. And as blood leaves, it's going to go through the branch of the pulmonary vein. The blood is going to be oxygenated. Note also that you will have some lymphatic vessels here. That's why I was saying also the lymphatics, uh, major lymphatics come out of the hilum. Now, when we look at the microscopic anatomy, we're examining the structures of the trachea first. What's the purpose of the trachea? That's really to clean the air of airborne particles before entry into the lungs. Uh, think about this, not just airborne particles, pollen, smoke particles. Everybody thinks of smoke as gases. There's lots and lots of small particles there, okay? Bacteria, dust, things like that. Uh, and dust and some of these other particles can actually carry things like viruses and bacteria and fungal spores and things like that. Now, when you get to the respiratory mucosa, this is mucous membranes that, that line the trachea. In that respiratory epithelium, this is specialized epithelial covering for the respiratory trachea. Now, think what's here. You've got a very thin layer of mucus, which acts like flypaper, which, you know, or, or, uh, particles get caught on it. But we got to get them out of here. That's where we have the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. In other words, they look stratified, but they're not. They have cilia, and it's the cilia that are projecting to the surface, as well as having goblet cells there, which are going to produce some of the mucus. And what the cilia do is they move the mucus upwards, okay, superiorly in direction, until it's either swallowed or spit out when it hits around the area of the larynx and the pharynx. Underneath that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, you have the lamina propria, which is a thin layer of connective tissue. Beneath that, you have submucosa, which you have more mucus and seroso glands and numerous blood vessels. You'll also notice these structures called tracheal glands. Underneath that, you're going to have cartilage. This is a type called hyaline cartilage. It is part of the adventitia. You'll notice lacunae and the chondrocytes when you look in the micro image. The perichondrium, otherwise known as the adventitia, this is consisting of fibrous connective tissue layer that covers the cartilaginous rings. You want to keep in mind also that the mucus is not just acting as flypaper. Okay? The mucus secretions also include lysozyme. This is an enzyme that kills bacteria in the respiratory system. So here's the epithelium. Here's the lamina propitia structures. You're going to see some of the seromucous glands here. Below that, here we have our cartilage. And you can see the little space of the lacunae. And in there would be, of course, the chondrocytes. And now we have more toughened material here. And that's the adventitia. So that is a slide that you want to keep mindful of. You can also see a closer magnification here of the trachea. Here you see some goblet cells. You see, of course, the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And you can even see, if you look very closely, right around here, the cilia. Okay? Underneath, you have the lamina propria, which is connective tissue. It's sort of the membrane that acts as a basement or a foundation where the columnar epithelium are attached to. Underneath that, you've got the submucosa here. And the seromucous glands in there, and then beneath that is where you have the hyaline cartilage. Now, microscopic anatomy. Let's examine the structure of the lungs. As the bronchial tubes get smaller, we go from, of course, primary, secondary, tertiary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's an amount of cartilage that will progressively decline. And when you get to the bronchioles, it's absent. The epithelial type changes from pseudostratified ciliated columnar that you'll see in the trachea 
in the initial bronchi, then it will go to columnar in the small bronchi, it'll go to cuboidal in the bronchioles, and then it gets squamous, flattened out in the alveolar. Structure relates to function, function relates to structure. You got to have a very flattened out cell and a single layer when you get to the alveoli. Now the bronchus, you'll note that they have some ciliated cells and goblet cells. The bronchioles, you'll notice a lining of cuboidal or low column epithelium. You do want to take some time to review uh, the respiratory airways, the respiratory bronchiole, alveolar duct, respiratory sac, and the alveolus. And you can see some of these structures here in this. Notice over here is a small blood vessel. Notice over here that you've got a very nice setup here with some of the bronchiole. Down in these large spaces, these are all the alveoli. Notice that they're very, very thin. And so what you have is a very thin cell layer. And then on top of that, let's say, is uh, the capillary. And that's it. So you have a very thin respiratory membrane and you want it thin. So the passage of gases from alveoli to the blood or from blood to the alveoli is very quick. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the microscopic anatomy of the alveoli. Type 1 alveolar cells, they're also referred to as type 1 pneumocytes. And the endothelial cells of the pulmonary capillaries for the, consist, make up the respiratory membrane. But you're going to find some other types of unusual cells in the alveoli. Type 2 alveolar cells are very important. They secrete a surfactant, which is a based, uh, is a phospholipid-based um, material. Now here's what it does. It lowers the surface tension along the surface of the alveoli and prevents air sacs from collapsing. The long and the short of it is this. If we have a very thin liquid member, a liquid coating, on the alveoli. The surface tension is so great that it would literally cause the alveoli to collapse, come together. The way that we reduce that surface tension, okay, because that's where surface tension is because of the polar molecules of water and they're going to be attracted to one another. So you reduce the uh, surface tension by adding alveoli, uh, adding the surfactant. Now, when we have babies that are born as preemies, what triggers them to start making surfactant is cortisol, their glucocorticoids. If it looks like the baby is going to come out, even though it could be, it would benefit from staying in the womb for a few more weeks, if not a month or two, what doctors will do is before delivery, they'll give mom a shot of cortisol. And as soon as the babies are born, they'll give them a shot of cortisol as well. Now, the purpose of that is to try to trigger the cells into making their own uh, surfactant. What used to happen before this uh, techniques were implemented is that babies born preemie would basically struggle to breathe for the first few days and eventually they would give out and die, which was very sad. Now we have techniques that basically from week 25 on, if we can get them to make their own surfactant, all the better. They used to try to extract surfactant from things like cow lungs, etc. Sometimes that works a little bit, sometimes it does not. But getting the actual infant, the newborn, to produce their own is the most beneficial route that doctors have found. When you take a look at the micrographs, try to identify some alveolar cells, pulmonary capillaries, and review the diagram of the respiratory membrane components, such as what you see here. Now, keep in mind also, when we talk about respiration, we have two components. External respiration, which is, of course, with pulmonary ventilation. We have gas coming into the lungs, and we have gas diffusion, oxygen going from alveoli into the blood at the capillaries. We have carbon dioxide released from the blood in the capillaries, goes into the alveoli, and gets basically exhaled out. Now, that's known as external respiration. Then we have the other concept called internal respiration. That's where we have gas diffusion from the blood across the capillaries into the tissues themselves.
the same time, depending on the metabolic activity of the tissues, we will make carbon dioxide and that will get diffused through and into the blood and carried away by the same blood. Okay, so that's known as internal respiration. So internal respiration is really at the tissue level. External is at the uh, pulmonary or lung level. Here are the different types of pneumocytes. Here is pneumocyte 1. Here is pneumocyte type 2. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, what are some of these holes? These are interconnections between adjacent alveoli. And there's another little strange one here, macrophage. The neat thing about alveolar macrophages is they will move around quietly all the time, either between the tissue or being right in the alveoli, and they are to keep the lungs sterile. No bacteria, no nothing. And if they are in there, then there is a serious possibility for an infection, okay? Notice the capillaries are all around through the walls of the alveoli. And there's also the presence of elastic fibers, which allows for a little bit of expansion and a little bit of recoil that always occurs. We have also what we call the air-blood barrier. And that's where you have the alveoli cell layer, this is where you have the surfactant coating the alveolar surface. Underneath that, you have a fused basement membranes that are basically coming from both the alveolar epithelium as well as the capillary endothelium. But you notice basically this distance is very short. Going across from alveoli to the capillary is almost less than one cell thickness because usually you're going to have this at the thinner end. Now, if this membrane got thicker, it would take longer for air or gas exchange to occur at this particular point, this blood-air barrier, and that could be disastrous for the individual. Now, I want to bring up something called pulmonary ventilation and looking at gas laws. You may have had gas laws in chemistry before. This is where it really comes, and uh, as the saying goes, the rubber meets the road. This is where you actually have an application for it. The way to think about it is this. When I inhale, I'm not pumping gas in. What I'm doing is I'm expanding the, the volume of my thoracic cavity. And as I do, the pressure in this cavity gets less than the atmospheric pressure. As a result, air follows from high pressure to low. It's going to go right in. When I relax my, uh, at my thoracic cavity, and so it contracts, and there's now less volume, the pressure is greater in that thoracic, thoracic cavity, the air pressure, than the atmosphere, and therefore the air whoo, comes out. Now, there's a formula that you've seen is P1 over V1 is equal to P2 over V2. What we're saying, and this is Boyle's Law, is that pressure of a gas in a closed container is inversely, that means opposite, proportional to its volume. If you increase the volume, you decrease the pressure. If you increase the pressure, you decrease the volume. That's how it works. All right? And I've explained this by definition of what inhalation, exhalation is. How do we get these changes, though? And this comes from movements of the diaphragm and ribs, which cause the changes in the thoracic volume. Now, serous secretion of the pleural membranes create a bond that prevents the lungs from collapsing. We want the, the lungs to be up close, almost in, in essence intimate, right next to the walls of the thoracic cavity. So what helps that are certain structures called pleura. You have the visceral pleura that really is attached to the lungs itself. The parietal pleura is attached to the thoracic cavity. And then there's a space in between them that's filled with a fluid. This is called the pleural cavity. Now, this is going to be filled with serous fluid. But beware. If an air bubble gets in, air is much more elastic than liquids. And as a result, you can have a really serious problem, which I'll get into in a second. Notice the size of this container and how the gas molecules bang against the walls. 
As they bang against the walls, that is what, what you would record as pressure. So if we decrease the volume of the container, we're increasing the pressure as more gas molecules bang against the walls. If I increase the volume, I get a decrease in the pressure because now it takes longer for gas molecules to come up against one of the walls and bang against it. Here is the point that I was talking earlier about that what you really have to do when you want to inhale, you're going to have the diaphragm contract and as it does, it, it tenses and moves inferiorly, it kind of straightens out. What happens also are other muscles uh, that play a role so that you have this flailing out to a point of the sternum and you have an increased amount as you raise up some of the ribs. Now to reverse that, you just have to reverse, relax a lot of the muscles and also that you have to be aware that the lungs have elastic fibers, such as what we discussed a little bit earlier in the alveoli. These elastic fibers will cause a natural recoil for the lungs. So what is atelaxis? This is a, a collapse or a closure of a lung resulting from uh, in reduced or absent gas exchange. Okay, a lot of times it's hard to think about this, but each lung is separated from the other from the perspective that they have their own separate pleural membranes. And so if one is affected, the other one not, is not necessarily. When you have an atelaxis, it's usually unilateral, affects part or all of one lung. This is often what we call a collapsed lung. So what can cause this? This is where we come into the concept of a pneumothorax. This is an abnormal collection of air in the pleural space between the lung and the chest wall. In essence, the air causes the lung to become detached from the thoracic wall it can on its own start to collapse. And the symptoms include a sudden onset of sharp, one-sided chest pain and a shortness of breath. Well, think about this, shortness of breath. Goodness gracious, if you have one lung collapse, A, it's gonna hurt like heck. And perhaps it's going to be having the other contribution of pain and discomfort by what caused the puncture into the thoracic side whether it was a knife or a bullet or a big piece of wood from, from something that the person fell on or something. But you're also going to have uh, the shortness of breath because instead of breathing for two lungs now, you're breathing for one. You have to remove that gas. You have to close up the uh, air gap or the leakage, and you have to reinflate the lung, which isn't that hard if you can get and vent out the uh, air bubble that's in that pleural space. As you can see here, I talked about the mechanisms earlier. We see here the pleural space, the visceral pl uh, pleura, the parietal pleura, the pleural fluid. Fluid doesn't have as much um, flexibility or elasticity as gases do or air. Therefore, if you get a small air bubble in here, it can stretch out and it will basically act as a breach of the pleural fluids attachment between the visceral and the, and the parietal. Also, if the pressure is greater on the outside than on the inside, okay, you're going to have air coming in. You always have it wherever it's max compared to the other chamber. In this case, first chamber is outside chamber. If the pressure on the outside is greater, you'll inhale. If the pressure on the inside is greater than the outside, you will exhale. And this is what I've just said, and this is how you can see this occurring here. You do need to be aware of the respiratory muscles. And these play a key role here. When we talk about normal inhalation, the elastic fibers in the walls of the bronchial tubes will stretch as the lung expands. So the key muscles for inhalation, normal inhalation, are the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. These are the muscles in between the ribs. Keep that in mind. Now, 
You ever had that situation where you were pushed well beyond your limits and suddenly you had to do running or something else and then you're breathing really heavy? <laughs> wow, you know, happens to me when I'm out of shape. Yep, and you know, I run across campus and boy, I have to really do forced inhalation. Now, forced inhalation brings in four other key muscles, sternocleomastoid, scalene, serratus anterior, and pectoralis minor, okay? Now, what about exhalation? As I said, remember, exhalation is going to be a partly a passive process because of the elastic recoil of the lungs. When inspiration muscles relax, the elastic fibers are going to recoil and the diaphragm, the ribs, and the sternum return to their original positions. Thoracic volume will decrease. Air moves out of the lungs following the air pressure gradient, which I talked about before. Now, what happens if you had to do forced exhalation? Forced inhalation? <sighs> okay, I've got to do a lot of ventilation here. So, expiratory muscles act to decrease thoracic volume. What are the expiratory muscles? There are six of them. The in, internal intercostal muscles, the transversus thoracicus muscles, the rectus abdominis, the external oblique and an internal oblique, as well as the transversus abdominis. Yes, you need to know these. You can see where the inspiratory muscles are, the primary, the external intercostals, as well as the diaphragm, and then the accessory inspiratory, which are the sternocleomastoid, the scalenes, the pectoralis minor, and the serratus anterior. When we talk about expiratory, as I mentioned to you before, you're going to get part of this done by the recoil. But before I leave, I want to make sure that you're clear on this. You can see here some of the accessory inspiratory muscles where they're located and how they shift the ribs and thereby shifting and increasing the amount of thoracic volume available. Keep in mind that uh, diaphragm is going to flatten out. The accessory expiratory muscles are basically the internal intercostals, the transversus thoraticus, the external obliques here, the rectus abdominis and the internal oblique. Now, we have also some formulas, et cetera. Now, here's one of the things I'm going to advise you. You couldn't do a hands-on with a spirometer. Although there are now very simple ones that are reliable, they can be handheld. Also, they make some that are virtually disposable because the measuring device is connected by a USB port to a laptop. And so what doctors do is they have this plastic part, which is disposable. They have the patient breathe in and out. It's not like these huge water chambers that you see in labs now. But first off, let's talk about the technology. A spirometry is a diagnostic technique used to measure respiratory volumes. The spirometer is the device used to measure respiratory volumes, and they have made them to the point where they can be handheld. A spirogram is a pen chart recording of the spirometry measurements. Now, there's a variety of respiratory volumes. The first one you've got to really know is toward the bottom here on this slide. You can see it's called tidal volume. What is it? Simple. It's the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs during normal inhalation, exhalation. So, simple part. But what about these other ones here? Expiratory re reserve volume, ERV. That's the maximum volume of air that can be forcefully exhaled after a normal exhalation. ERV is equal to EC, which is the expiratory capacity, minus the tidal volume. So, what you really want is you want What's the expiratory capacity, which is the maximum volume of air that can be forcefully exhaled after a normal inhalation? Now, you might still sit there and go, look, this is a lot of data. How does it relate to anything? If you had uh, bronchial constriction 
You can bring the air in, perhaps, but it's harder to breathe it out. That happens with some individuals with certain types of respiratory problems, like even asthma. But we've been talking about expiring out. And by the way, here are a couple of these different models here of the handheld spirometers. There's also some you probably have seen in a hospital setting. And basically, they're very simple and no electronics. You just breathe into it and it tells you the volume. They use, it's very common to see these with patients with pneumonia because it gives them an idea about whether their, their lungs are clearing, whether there's a certain amount of fluid that has built up and taken up the volume uh, of the lungs. And so that would cause a reduction in the respiratory uh, volumes, you know, both exhaling, inhaling, and the tidal volume. But as I mentioned a second ago, what about the other side of, in, of expir, uh, expiration? The inspiratory reserve volume, IRV, is the maximum amount of air that can be forcefully inhaled after a normal inhalation. So, how much can you hold? <coughs> I can cough out more. Anyways, inspiratory capacity, IC, is the maximum volume of air that can be forcefully inhaled after a normal exhalation. So IC is equal to TV plus IRV. The IRV that you saw earlier is basically VC minus EC, okay? Functional residual capacity. This is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after normal expiration. In other words, even if you go blow out as much as you can, you're still gonna have some there because what's gonna be there is A, the residual volume, RV, that's the amount of air that remains in the lungs after the most forceful expiration. And you're also going to have the EV, okay? And all of these are going to take up some space in that lungs. Now, a lot of times they don't measure these things by just a breathe in and breathe out. Being one who has also seen a pulmonologist, I can tell you that, you know, they want you to breathe out as long as you can, as hard as you can, and then they want to monitor normal activity for a bit. And so the monitoring of it takes some time. And that's why our next measure, the respiratory minute volume, is the volume of air that moves in and out of the lungs per minute during a normal inhalation, exhalation. Okay. Alveolar ventilation is the amount of air that enters the alveolar airways each minute. And the formulas to extract that out. Now, even if you were to take somebody's lung or even such as like a sheep pluck, which basically is go to the abattoir, go to the slaughterhouse, get out the, the, uh, the lungs from a sheep. You can view them, you can review them, etc. If they were completely deflated, they're still going to have some space in there occupied with air because you've got the air remaining in the conducting airways, and then it never enters the alveoli. That's called the anatomical dead space. Now, I note here in this tri activities 26.626.7. Since you don't have lab partners, don't panic. Don't do it. Okay? I'll tell you what you have to deal with in a bit. Now, here's a spirogram that would normally give you, and this is the tidal volume. So you breathe in, you breathe out, you breathe in, you breathe out. Then they may turn around and say, quick. Give me as much inhalation as you can. Quick, then give me as much as you can exhale out. And then they watch you bounce back and you go through your tidal volumes. And all of these formulas do exist and tell different details of pulmonary function and whether there are certain respiratory disorders that are present. Now, what are we going to do here? I want you to review the gross anatomy of the respiratory system and any of the models or slides, basically what you see in the review text, in other words, in the lab text, Siracus. Review the respiratory system function, including the importance of Boyle's Law and the muscles of the respiratory system. Now, you're going to get a handout. That's the worksheet. You can find that on your Blackboard. It's going to consist of... It's going to be one download, but it's going to consist of pages 463 to 466, as well as 483. 
you are to turn in the worksheet by the end of the week, by Friday, 5 p.m. Now, to help you understanding some of these things, review the lab videos, okay, and the lab manual notes. But um, when it comes to using the spirometry, be familiarized with it as a tool, and that's about it. And I hope you have a nice day.